Sanatana Dharma Eradication Conference. This is worse than the anti-Hindutva conference that was being organized. At least that was in the US. This is in India. What is going on in this country? Every time the DMK finds itself in a political soup, the first option of resort is to attack Hinduism, is to attack Sanatana Dharma. The Dravidian movement has always been a separatist movement. The founders of the Justice Party even go to the United Kingdom with representations to the effect freedom movement should not succeed because should it succeed, it will translate to a restoration of Brahminical rule. And these were the people who even observed the Independence Day as Black Day. Mr. Rivi Ramaswamy. Periyar. Periyar. I won't call him Periyar. That's an epithet which is respectful. I don't wish to use that. The dirtiest part of Dravidianist politics was competition for the Brahmin woman. She was offered as the price. The exodus of the Brahmin community from Madras presidency and subsequently in Tamil Nadu is an unsung story with nobody having captured it properly. We may want to even ask this question, why is it that Indian history has given two different treatments, one to the Ambedkarat movement and one to the Dravidianist movement? Why do you want to have two different yardsticks or standards to be applied to two sets of movements, both of which are based on anti-Brahminism? There was this uh, Dravidianist poet Bharti Dasan who basically came out with this saying that if you see a snake and you see a Brahmin, kill the Brahmin first. The end game of Dravidianism was always destruction of Hinduism. The reason why the missionaries want the destruction of caste is not because they want an egalitarian society. It takes away that one final barrier that prevents conversion. Namaste Jai Hind, welcome to another edition of ANI Podcast with Smita Prakash. Thank you for writing in with your suggestions. We realize that there are times when we get guests who do not meet with your approval. But our attempt always is to bring about a discussion on ideas and opinions that many Indians in India and some Indians who are expat Indians are confronted with almost on a daily basis. Today, our issue is on Sanatana Dharma and Dravidianism. And all this because of a comment made by a son of a chief minister of the state of Tamil Nadu, who's also a minister in his cabinet. Now, if you don't live in South India, or say you're not a Tamil, or you're not a Hindu, or you're a secular Hindu, does it matter when someone who occupies a high post says that Sanatana Dharma needs to be eradicated from India? Does a comment like that constitute hate speech or not? What is Sanatan Dharma? What is Dravidianism? And what was Uday Nidhi Stalin saying? My guest today will give a historical contest to Sanatana Dharma and Dravidianism and that comment. Sai, thank you so much for being part of the podcast. Uh, we do want you to demystify for our viewers and listeners what is Sanatana Dharma, what is Dravidianism and why are these two in conflict with each other? Is it something new? Has it been there for a long time? And of course, nobody better than you. Uh, you're no stranger to the ANI podcast. For our viewers and listeners, J. Sai Deepak is no stranger. He's appeared on episode 32 seven months ago. That episode has near about 4 million views on YouTube and a massive following on audio platforms too. Sai Deepak is an engineer turned litigator turned author. His two books, India that is Bharat, Coloniality, Civilization, Constitution and India, Bharat and Pakistan, The Constitutional Journey of a Sandwich Civilization are two voluminous, well-researched books on the Indian civilization. Sai is a much sought-after public speaker and has a massive fan following. Sai, let's begin right away with Uday Nidhi's comment before we talk about the whole concept of, you know, the larger uh, picture about Sanatan Dharma and all. Let's just begin first with Uday Nidhi's comment. I'm going to read out the comment so that uh, viewers and listeners who don't live in India and or who don't watch TV and, you know, who are not into social media much don't know what the controversy is. Let's just begin with that. Now, he said there are some things which we have to eradicate and we can't merely oppose. Mosquitoes, dengue fever, malaria, corona, all these are things which we cannot oppose. We have to eradicate them. Sanatanam is also this. Eradicating, not opposing Sanatanam should be our first task. Now, he said this. Uh, why do you think he suddenly spoke about this? I mean, there are uh, people who live in Tamil Nadu say that it's something that his father Stalin and his grandfather Karunanidhi mm. have said behind closed doors or in whispers. Yeah. But now it's come out in the open and it's not as if it was an off-the-cuff remark. Yeah. He, he clearly knew what he was saying and he's uh, said it uh, well thought out uh, thing at a, at a conference. What so, conference? Sanatana Dharma Eradication Conference. What else do you expect him to speak on? 
he said what he said because that was the theme of the conference people have latched on to his statement but the fact that there is a platform that has been put together hmm. how different is it this is worse than the uh, anti hindutva conference that was being organized or that was organized in the us a few months ago at least that was in the us this is in india bharat rather and you have people who have managed to put together uh, such an event the hrc minister shekhar babu of tamil nadu was wearing saffron and he he was on the stage when the statement was being made he was he participated in the conference and what, what does is, H wearing saffron have to do with it no the man usually um, sports that dress to basically indicate that he is a practicing hindu at least for the sake of optics but everything that the tamil nadu hrc department has done which is the hindu religious and charitable endowments department has done ever since the dmk has taken over or even before no government has been different in this regard has been everything but hindu it's completely anti hindu but for someone who presides over a department that is dedicated to hindu religious and charitable endowments to preside and participate in a in a in a conference that is dedicated to sanatan dharma eradication what is going on in this country really what is going on in this country replace sanatan dharma with any other caste subsect sect sampraday or any other religion what would we have on our hands civil and order law and order issues Yeah, literally these people have gotten away with something that they should have never been allowed to you mean if there had been a conference on islam and there would have been a talk about shia or sunni that is the sects of islam and eradication of a sect would have resulted in a hate crime or a Correct. hate speech and thing here an entire religion is sought to be eradicated and it's been compared with what diseases malaria dengue mosquitoes what is being said here but he, they are saying that it's not eradication of a religion mm. but eradication of sanatana dharma so what is sanatana dharma Haan, according, to tell so me. according to him sanatana dharma is a subsect of hinduism sanatana dharma is the heart of hinduism <laughs> to actually make the silly distinction so you have to realize something is here and you ask me why has he said this what is the timing there are quite a few issues at play here one 2024 obviously i.n.d.i.a right that's the other issue mm -hmm. so clearly the the opposition or the coalition that they've put together has this as their stated agenda which you can see in all the statements being echoed and stated after udanadi stalin statement uh, mr malikarjun malikarjun kharge said something to this effect where he said that if mr modi is back then sanatana dharma will rule right at least his statement is still tolerable to some extent mm. then i think uh, the congress spokesperson in tamil nadu ms ramachandran has also made a similar statement right where they say and i think uh, the other gentleman priyank uh, kharge kharge look at his statement that anything that has inequality at the heart of it and caste at, as at its heart is as good as a disease and it needs to be eradicated these are the kind of statements that have been that have been made unbelievable see i i don't know should should i be outraged at what was said and who said it or should i be disappointed at the fact that there's been hardly any reaction from the hindu society hmm. it's almost as if they've it's par for course it's something that they've come to accept as a matter of daily political life in this country so the congress official uh, spokesperson who uh, gave the press conference said that the congress believes in sarva dharma sambhavana mm -hmm. so uh, there are multiplicity of views about hinduism and uh, he is welcome to his view is the is the general uh, opinion so in so are we allowed to hold similar views with respect to any other faith system in this country hmm. i'm sorry but if this question cannot be answered in isolation but see the larger issue is uh, there is some person there's one person who is missing in this entire picture where is the finance minister of tamil nadu or at least mr ptr tyagarajan why has he been sidelined from the dmk it wing because of the release of certain tips which annamalai undertook a few months ago right ever since those revelations and that expose the man's been completely sidelined prior to the elections he basically said we are not an anti hindu party and he traced back Uh, the origins of the dmk to the antecedents which is the justice party antecedents because his uh, his ancestors were founders of the justice party hmm. and he said look at me i support the the kunkumam i support this we are the tra traditional custodians and trustees of the madurai meenakshi temple and we certainly look at the panchangam before we undertake uh, or swear in all these statements were made right now that's man's completely silent in fact in that interview of his prior to dmk's victory three people were named 
as Tiya Sakti, which means evil forces in Tamil. Tiya means evil, Sakti is force. Sadhguru, uh, temple campaigner and activist T.R. Ramesh and advocate J. Sai Deepak. Three of us were named as evil forces which are out to destroy the secular fabric of the great state of Tamil Nadu. This is what he said. You don't even live in Tamil Nadu. I don't. Okay, Mr. <laughs> evil Sai. <laughs> okay, go on. And when he said that, um, he basically said, no, we are not anti-Hindu at all. Hmm. Now, I'd like to ask this gentleman, what is your position today in light of what Udayanidhi Stalin has said, who is effectively the, the scion of the DMK family. It's not a party, it's the DMK family. Now, he has made this statement hmm. because if you listen to Anna Malay's expose, it significantly relates to who are the true beneficiaries of all those dealings. Which dealings? A lot of dealings have taken place. In the, the financial dealings. Financial dealings. Okay. And the question was, whether there is an excess between the person who was alluded to in those steps and the person who has recently made the statement. You are now uh, giving political uh, color to this. Every time the DMK finds itself in a political soup, the first option of resort is to attack Hinduism, is to attack Sanatana Dharma and is to talk about social justice and egalitarianism hmm. because it has nothing else to offer when faced with pointed questions. That is part of the larger game. But coming to the more serious issue, it is consistent with Dravidianist ideology, starting from its origins and then from the origins of the Justice Party to the DK to the DMK. It's been the case all the while. It's no okay. different. Now demystify this for our viewers and listeners. Uh, what is the Justice Party? What is Dravida Kazagam, that is the uh, uh, DK, right. and then the offshoots of that, and then the DMK which comes in. Also break it down for us, uh, that what is the Dravidian movement? Is it, was it, a se is it or was it a separatist movement? When did it morph to not becoming a separatist movement? Because uh, those of you who don't know about this, you can even uh, uh, Google and uh, you can uh, see on YouTube, uh, Sai Deepak has spoken about Jinnah and the separatist movement and the connection with DMK. So break it all down for us now. The Dravidian movement has always been a separatist movement. It has only chosen to cloak its fangs. The separatist aspect of its behavior is almost central to its existence and therefore it is only uh, biding its time. And given the kind of support that this movement has given to all sorts of anti-Bharat forces throughout its history, I have no reason to believe that it has abandoned its stripes. It hasn't. And with time, I think you will see that uh, the, the fangs will be bad even better for people's consumption. See, it's it's impossible to think of the history or even speak of its of, of Dravidianist ideology without referring to its missionary origins. Hmm. Absolutely impossible. There are there are enough documents, there is enough literature, scholarly literature at that, to point to the fact that the origins of the word Dravida in a racial, linguistic, and religious sense must be traced to German Lutheran missionaries around 1706. And there is there is a specific book to this particular effect. I think it's written by Professor Sweetman. I'll, I'll even share the details of the book. And he specifically points out how they come to this country. And of course, missionaries here were not just to save our souls, but obviously the only way to save your soul is to convert. There's no other way. Hmm. And therefore, their work is to understand the culture of the people. So the, one of the things that they choose to do is to try and look for all ways in which the religion of the South can be separated from the religion of the North. Why? Because they want to establish. So this is called balkanization of culture. And this is part of their acculturation process, which is unless and until you're able to unravel a particular strand from the entire fabric, it's difficult to convert that fabric or let's say that strand into your fold. So you have to do it one by one. So first they try and convert, they try to convert the Brahmins, which they find an impossible task. And you're looking at the 18th century, which was certainly impossible. Today it's possible. So when they tried doing it, they realized that what is coming in their way is the construct of Varnashrama Dharma, wherein every community and every caste 
relates to the larger Hindu fabric through the most proximal identity which is close to which is its caste identity so caste is religion for each person then or mm. for each group around that point of time so they realize that i don't seem to be able to break the entire structure let me see if i can take the parts out and therefore they start looking for fissures or creating fissures between two broad baskets brahmins and non brahmins that's how the movement actually starts and then they start looking for uh establishing the fact that saiva siddhanta is indigenous to the south and has nothing to do with the north or with the aryan religion or the vedic religion these are the kind of initiatives that they undertake mm-hmm. because saiva siddhanta is seen as the most predominant faith system in the south you have to find ways to cleave that from the hindu fabric or the dharmic fold that is that that project starts in 1800s 1700s and they're significantly aided by the works of uh missionaries preceding them such as the this french missionary called abbe dubois who undertakes perhaps the most comprehensive analysis of the caste structure not the caste structure the varna structure which he translates to caste structure and he puts together a book the copyright for which is purchased by the governor general of the madras presidency who chooses to use this for his census calculation and what not and of course for other administrative reasons from there to the point where anibesen's home rule movement is opposed by the founders of the justice party in cahoots with the colonial establishment on the ground that the congress party is a brahmin party the home rule movement is a brahminical movement wait wait wait, wait. Right. now don't break this wait right, one minute right. so parallelly uh, annie besant's movement is con- uh, starting i'm saying from there to the annie besant movement from, from there, 1700s okay. to the annie besant movement ah. there is a continuity you're talking about 100 years at close to 200 years 200 years at least 150 years starting from 1706 to the home rule movement okay. look at it ha huh. so the same argument finds a lot of purchase because what happens is you have three or four parallel tracks being worked upon one is the religious track by the missionaries then the theories that they put forth in terms of the race, racial distinction the linguistic distinction and the religious distinction between the people of the south and the so called north is then given political traction now that political traction is then absorbed by the founders of the justice party because they have a serious problem with the fact that less than 3.2% of the southern population of madras presidency which is the brahmin population occupies high positions of power in the colonial establishment so the chettiars the nayars and the mudaliars they are the founders of the justice party they have a problem with this and they say why should english positions or let's say establishment positions be appropriated by a population which is less than 3.5% of the entire population so then they start seeking reservations and re- uh, equal representation in government position this is more or less the basis for tamil nadu's position till date mm. that we are entitled to more than 50% of the uh, let's say more than 50% reservation which is the law laid down in indra sani so on and so forth so to the extent that when the home rule movement is going on the founders of the justice party even go to the united kingdom with representations to the effect that this movement should not succeed because should it succeed the freedom movement the freedom movement should not succeed because should it succeed it will translate to restoration of brahminical rule so justice party is the founding political body so this justice party of tamil nadu goes to the uk and says don't give freedom to home india. rule correct to india uh, or to the congress party don't give home rule because that will mean brahminical, brahminical supremacy supremacy okay and these were the people who even observed the independence day as black day hmm. they wore black shirts which is of course the shirt yeah. that they used to wear so justice party uh, as a movement uh, gains traction significantly on its anti brahmin plank hmm. there is a caste politics by then which has already found a significant amount of purchase thanks to all the work of the colonial establishment and the preceding missionaries by then so the most popular figures who are responsible for creating this fissure through their scholarly work you have an administrator by the name francis ellis white then you have uh, one missionary by the name uh, uh robert caldwell and then george pope uh, each of them takes the scholarship forward and mainstreams it to the extent that the places from which they operated out of you will see a significant christian population that's always been in the tamil nadu in tamil tirunelveli then kasi go to these places okay. kanyakumari that's that's how this i mean that was the experimental place that was the breeding ground for the ideology right now then when the justice party wants to 
succeed on the basis of its anti-Brahmin plank. It certainly latches on significantly to all these theories to say Brahmins are Aryans. They are northerners. The language that they speak, Sanskrit, is closer to Hindi. Our language is different. Look at the differences in script. We are an indigenous people. But actually, it was not so, right? Because the ancient uh, texts were Sanskrit and they were there in Tamil Nadu. If you talk to practitioners of the Vedic knowledge system, the belief is this. There are two uh, grammarians, Panini and Agastya. Panini is responsible for Sanskrit. Agastya is responsible for Tamil. The Sanskrit, sorry, the Tamil uh, structure is based on what is called Agatyam, which is nothing but a upper branch or a corruption of Agastyam. Hmm. Okay. Now, going by their logic, Agastya was a North Indian. <laughs> hmm. So, Tamil has to be uh, credited to someone who has come specifically down the Vindhyas for the purposes of civilization. Right? What is the belief? There is a fantastic sutra. It's called Maheshwarani Sutra. And there, the belief is that Shiv, Lord Shiva's Damru has two sides. Mm. And the movement of the Damru and the sound that emanates from it gives rise to all the languages. Mm. The sounds, the, the primordial sounds which give birth to languages come from the Damru. Mm. So the belief is that one side has Om in Sanskrit and the other has Om in Tamil. Okay. This is the belief. Mm. Now going by this, what is the logic here then? So, the only way that you can act actually break the structure and this philosophy is by saying that Saiva Siddhanta itself is native to the south. Okay, it's got nothing, or it's indigenous to the south and it's got nothing to do with the north. The larger cultural continuity, the fact that Choras and all the ruling empires and dynasties of the country, of, of the Tamil kingdom, so to speak, what is, what is called Tamaragam, would have Chaturvedi Mangalam, which means at the heart of the city would be established Agraharas for Brahmins, and they would be allowed to surround the temple as the first garland, hence Agraharam. And that's how they would establish it. They had no antipathy towards Brahmins and there is no record of any caste discrimination in that scripture and stone inscriptions. So all that epigraphic literature, all that archaeological literature, literature everything is sidelined because this invented theory has to gain traction. And that was mainstream by the colonial establishment, unfortunately with active support from Indians. Okay, so let's get back now to uh, what happened about the separatist uh, tendencies. One was the home rule, uh, opposing the home rule. What what else did the Justice Party do, which is the parent organization of the... So from Justice Party, you'll come to the DK, from there you come to the DMK. Right, so what else did the Justice Party do, which was separatist in nature? So you have to realize that you're looking at a period when uh, communal electorates was already introduced by the Minto Morley reforms. Hmm based on the Shimla declaration or the Shimla delegation of the Muslim League in 1906. Now that sets a precedent for a lot of groups who want to do two things. Take benefit of separate electorates, but if you have to seek the benefit of separate communal electorates, you have to establish the fact that you are also a distinct community in itself. Mm. Right? So who does it? The birth of Khalistan is not of 1980s. It happens around this period. Because by then, the Sikh identity is significantly cleaved away from the Hindu identity. This happens in one part of the country, in the north of Vindhyas, where the colonial establishment undertakes a, a systematic exercise of de-Hinduizing everything that, re, that pertains to the Sikh religion and say, you're a, de, you're a separate panth altogether. You are not part of this fold. Unfortunately, that finds traction as well. And they start asking for separate electorates there only to be rejected later. And they continue to make Who those efforts. It? The uh, The Punjab council, the state council rejected it. Hmm. Then of course, in the south... That was not a Brahminical conspiracy or a Sanatan conspiracy to reject it? Or was it? No. So there was no such conspiracy. The, at that point, there was a significant division even between British authorities hmm. as to whether this particular community or group can be treated as a separate community altogether. Okay. So the okay. antipathy between the Sikh identity and the Hindu identity must be traced to this period okay. to a large extent. From there, you come to the south. And in the south, uh, the non brahmins of the Madras presidency claim that they must be treated as a separate community altogether. And it's not possible to do so unless and until you de-Hinduize these identities significantly. And geographically or politically, Madras presidency is not the Tamil Nadu of no, today. it was Just massive. It was going up till Orissa. Orissa bordering Bengal. Yeah, yeah bordering. Right? 
so, so you have people who don't know about i mean you know the the youth of today right. you know who are sitting they probably think humko kya we are not tamilians <laughs> not realizing that originally even if you lived in andhra pradesh or orissa of today Correct. you were also part of madras presidency that's why the word madrasi is used because madras connotes so many regions yeah i become a madrasi too then for all practical purposes yeah. i am not saying of course that there was no pejorative sense in which it was used Correct. at some yes. point of course it was hmm. but nevertheless the fact is all of these regions were clubbed together as part of one presidency hmm. hence the word madrasi that's where it comes from yeah now uh, when this this request is made So there is a fantastic book I think by uh, G K Singh on constitutional law which captures the entire history of this period right until the 1935 act the government mm. of india act of 1935 and mm. he shows in clear detail mm. how these representations were made repeatedly mm. and the congress would say should you recognize this then even if there is a possibility of a parley between the british establishment and the congress we are off the table we are not going to do this mm. okay So they said we will not entertain this kind of a nonsense at all under any circumstances because it cleaves the society second the justice party is being propped up as the competition to the congress party in the south with the support of the colonial establishment okay so around this period is when there is a greater movement or a greater emphasis to somehow find an indigenous religious justification which warrants the grant of a separate communal electorate for people from the south who are non brahmins so this is exclusively not for people from the, for, from the south all people from the south it's exclusively for the non brahmin communities how were they supposed to do this i'll explain that yeah so their point was that considering the disproportionate representation of brahmins in the colonial establishment we are a disenfranchised lot and this discussion happens in the british parliament also saying what do we do of this representation to which there are quite a few members of the british uh, establishment who say that this is a most mischievous representation for the simple reason that all these people are landed communities with extensive wealth with extensive political influence with extensive social influence as well so for them to ride on the backs mm. of the communal electorates of the muslims is extremely mischievous and for them to gang up together against a population which has no other means of survival which has no land which are landless destitute which is the brahmins also reeks of bullying that's the language that's used in the british parliament there okay mm. now uh, all this while mr e v ramaswamy was originally a member of the congress periyar periyar i won't call him periyar that's an epithet which is respectful i don't wish to use that he remains e v ramaswamy naidu e v ramaswamy nayakar that's his name so that's how i will refer to him so this gentleman um, who was a member of the congress chooses to come out because he sees this as a coterie of brahmins who have come together and largely he sees the congress as a north indian uh, conglomeration of brahmins though he is still in the congress at that time correct he was still in the congress and it's funny that you then see that similar allegations are subsequently hurled against the bjp when it's when it seeks to enter the south mm. right so the parallels are not that different Uh, or they are not that uh, dissimilar now when he starts what is known as the dk the dk is more or less a social organization it doesn't see itself as a political organization it wants to be in a position to invest in the society through its ideology and try and convert them to its 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 belief system what is it one there is no god that's the stated position but that exclusively applies to the hindu gods alone second brahmins are aryans and brahmins are single handedly responsible for taking away your jobs uh they live off the fat of the land and uh, apart from the study of the vedas they never contribute to anything else they are incapable of taking up any kind of work that requires the use of physical labor if you read nazi literature about jews of that particular period and you compare it with the dk's literature and the dmk's literature which is used in the context of brahmins you will not find it any different whatsoever at all who are the jews in this the brahmins and they go to the extent of saying that apparently uh, i think there is some literature to this effect that they even seek to establish some kind of an ethnic relationship between the jews and brahmins to justify all their hate filled literature that is a systematic ideology that was that was pushed with active support from the missionaries hmm. not just that ev ramaswamy is an upper caste person who kannada speaking 
three languages. I don't know whether it's Kannada or Telugu. Yes, I don't know. It's Kannada, Tamil, and Telugu. Telugu, right? Right. So he speaks three languages. Upper caste person. Right. He uh, he feels uh, persecuted when he goes to Kashi. Right. And he turns against. He was like the white of those times who feels he's an African American. Okay. <laughs> so he feels a sense of persecution, and mm. he feels that. this is what is happening it's, i think there's some case that he went to a chowl tree he or something he goes to a chowl tree and, and he's denied access there yeah. and the fact of the matter is in so, all these places yeah. all chowl trees are significantly caste based yeah. so even if a brahmin were to go to some other chowl tree he wouldn't have been given access it's not as yeah. if only non brahmins are denied access in a brahminical place yeah. it works both ways casteism in this country has always been a two way street so it was a uh, it was uh, some kind of a persecution that he it was a personal a uh, experience that Now, we don't know if that's a reality or if, if it's hagiography yeah, we don't knows. know so he turns atheist at some point of time he turns atheist right now the justice party which is the parent organization of today's dmk right uh they brought into them people who were atheist muslims christians everybody it was a parent that's their claim that's their claim because see the idea is that you need to form huh. a coalition which is exclusive of the brahmins So the only criteria was anti-Brahmanism. Anti-Brahmanism. Because how does hmm. how do you already explained now that how that Khalistan uh, thing, how do how do they find a chord which is resonant with Jinnah asking for a separate land for Muslims? So you see, when uh, this conversation happens, um, they are basically saying that they want a Dravidastan. Hmm. Okay. is it getting popularity in tamil nadu or madras presidency at this stage see uh, in the political circles it is kosher hmm. okay but if you go down to the street and you talk to the average citizen they know for a fact that they are living in an extremely corrupt regime and which only is interested in keeping them away from joining the indian mainstream and the best example for that in recent times has been the exclusive treatment that tamil nadu has sought uh, has sought uh, in the context of neat no i'm talking about the 40s right now when right. they when they speak with jinnah let's let's stay with right right uh, the period at that time right. was it gaining traction among the people huge, it was huge 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 okay. huge you see one is i think when you're uh, when you choose to gang up against Uh, a community which has no muscle so to speak which doesn't even have land and the only thing that it is in a position to command is the respect of the people thanks to the social position it has consistently held uh, it's very difficult to uh, stem let's say prevent the tide and two you're also offering a lot of things in return one of the things that was also offered and this is the dirtiest part of dravidianist politics was competition for the brahmin woman she was offered as the price if you read that literature If you read that literature, you'll be surprised at the language that's used. The filthiest of words being used, and 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 uh, let's say connotations being used, and the manner in which temples have even been described as places where people just go to ogle at each other, where women go to see other men, and men go there to see their women being groped by others. This is the language that's actually used by Ewe Ra in his in his literature when he speaks of temples. there is also enough literature to show how entire let's say localities were exterminated of brahmins through sexual attacks around that period and subsequently 1940s yes before the dmk came into existence and after particularly i'm digressing but do you think the attack on jailalitha in the uh, without house? a doubt what do you think was the language that she was referred to on the floor of the house I am not going to stand up for Jayalalitha here, given her treatment of Kanchi Shankar Acharya. Okay. Okay. Uh, however, it remains a fact that she was significantly targeted for two reasons: one, that she was a woman, and two, that she was a Brahmin woman, particularly an Iyengar from Mysore. Therefore, the constant hint and suggestion that she is not a Tamilian by any yardstick, by any conventional yardstick. Well, they accepted M. G. Ramachandran, who is from Sri Lanka and Sri who Lanka. was a Malayali. <laughs> I don't know what to say. And perhaps we should also start asking questions as to what was the mother tongue of the uh, deceased ancestor of Udayanidhi Stalin. Was it Tamil or Telugu? We don't know. Hmm. Right. Okay, but we were talking about the uh, the Brahmin woman. Right. Ah, uh, so. it is possible that the attack a lot of the attack on jailalitha 100% was because of hugely casteist heavily casteist hmm. see 
uh, I haven't come across the the persecution of Kashmiri pundits is well known, and particularly because it involves another community, it's even well known. And the exodus was for people to watch and see. It was physical. The exodus of the Brahmin community from Madras presidency and subsequently in Tamil Nadu is an unsung story with nobody having captured it properly. And nobody has an idea as to what has happened. Hmm. How they've been consistently persecuted. People can call me uh, a Manwadi, a Brahminical stooge or whatever they wish to, but this story has to be said. When you're comfortable listening to my story on the partition, on several other issues, then surely I'm entitled to present facts even on this aspect because this is one of the most uncomfortable, nastiest aspects of Bharatiya history. Which has been normalized, right? Normalized completely in the name of social justice. Like, uh, just to digress from it, uh, I, recently I was speaking to a, a uh, somebody who knows uh, Tamil Nadu politics and I was just mentioning that you know uh, what if um, uh, Nirmala Sitaraman or S.J. Shankar were to contest uh, you know a Lok Sabha polls in 2024 uh, can they do that in Tamil Nadu they said no impossible Im yeah impossible I'll give you an example from my own fraternity without dropping names someone who hails from the north of Bindhyas with a fair complexion but is uh, known for erudition, scholarship, patience, dignity and integrity, uh, subsequently comes to occupy a certain position in the justice dispensation system of Tamil Nadu. The tenure was made miserable, absolutely miserable, thanks to the surname, thanks to the complexion, and because of the fact that he hails from the north of India's. This is the extent to which separatism and regional chauvinism, chauvinism has been entrenched in the DNA of Tamil Nadu politics by Dravidianism. That's a cancer which is worse than Kashmiri separatism because Kashmiri separatism at least has an AK-47 in hand, so it's clear. Dravidian separatism doesn't wield AK-47, it wields the pen. Oh. And, it, and, it uses, and it uses pop culture, theatre, that's how it is. Poetry, tradition. right? Yes, that, that's how they've operated. And the venom that they've spewed and normalized because they have normalized hatred through the pen so people don't understand how visceral it actually is on the streets. Mm. And the kind of incestuous nexus that they've established with the jihadi ecosystem in the south is unbelievable. And the evangelical ecosystem, the radical evangelical ecosystem in the south. It's almost as if the south has become a breeding ground for rampant conversions. We don't even talk about it. From Andhra Pradesh to Tamil Nadu. But the cancer certainly started in Tamil Nadu in Madras presidency. You know, uh, in one of your uh, talks, you had talked about Dravidistan uh, and the role played by Jinn. I asked you that earlier also. Uh, how, how did it come up and at what stage uh, did the Justice Party find uh, some common chord with Jinnah? See, the common enemy around that point was the Congress. And since it had already be, been given this Hindu Brahminical hue, although the Congress never saw itself as Hindu party of all the parties, it, it has never seen itself as a Hindu party. Hmm. That's the fact. So on the negotiating table, Jinnah uh, has very clear demands which go well beyond what was already given in the Minto Mahler reforms. In 1940, I think it's in the Kanchipuram session, when the call for Dravidasthan is passed or this resolution is passed, by, of course, members of the South. Kanchipuram being selected, imagine of all the places, the place where the uh, Shankaracharya Matha is actually there, Kanchi Matha is there, that is used for this, this call. The Congress says that we will not sit at the negotiating table with Jinnah if he is going to support the call for Dravidasthan. Why? Who says that? The Congress says this. But why? Because they're saying that this translates to balkanization of the country and we have no interest in treating members of the Hindu fold at par with members of the Muslim fold. Because at least there's a clear religious divide and we understand that divide even if we don't agree with it. So who do you think said that? Was it Patel, Nehru, Rajgopalachari? See, uh, around the 1940, I would say that obviously by then, uh, from 1920 August onwards, Gandhi was calling the shots. Quite a few people, of course, Rajagopalachari would have certainly said it. I don't remember the exact individuals involved in this. But right. as an establishment, this was their institutional position. Their organizational position was, we will not support it. Annie Besant was a, was a vocal, vociferous opponent of this. She never agreed to this. Okay. Because she was also, you have to realize, a deep student of Bharatiya history and Sanskriti. 
she is one of the founding members of the Theosophical Society of India, which is based out of RDR, right? That was used against her, saying she's part of a Brahminical clique. So when the Congress refuses to sit at the negotiating table and says that we will not entertain this particular concept, now Jinnah being Jinnah, he's more interested in securing the rights of Muslims and to secure for them whatever he believes is the right of primacy or importance than supporting the, the Dravidianists. So uh, Ambedkar on the one hand and uh, the proponents of Dravidistan, both of them are abandoned by Jinnah. Because he is saying, I am interested in supporting your cause, provided it helps my cause. If you remember in the last podcast, I specifically said how the unity for Khal well, for the Khilafat movement was, Khilafat, yes. right, was a matter of convenience. Yeah. That's the same situation here. But that was the other way around. Right. It was a matter of convenience for, Mr. Ga uh, for Gandhi. Gandhi as well. Yeah. So here when they realize that if he were to tag along with the other two, then the Congress will not even listen to his point of view. He drops them fully. Hmm. And at that point, these guys realize that it's not going to work. Justice Party. The Justice Party. So they undertake this activity on their own. They continue to ask for separate treatment. See, there is another historical... Ask case. from whom? From the British? From the British as well as from the Congress establishment that we must be given special treatment. Okay. See, there are, there is, there are two reasons here. Hmm. For the British man who, who came to this country, what was his first port of exposure to Bharat? Bengal. Plassey, Baksar, those are the hmm. Hmm. places. Uh... Madras is slightly later because the first colonizer of the south was not the British man but the Portuguese. Hmm. Madras was in fact, for all practical purposes, you can say was founded by the Portuguese as we know it today. This, uh, a lot of churches there were established by the Portuguese. A lot of temples were destroyed by the Portuguese. The Kapali Ishwara temple, which you see in Mayalapur today, its original place of location was the St. Thomas Basilica. And uh, you will find a hoarding clearly saying that this is where it was. The shivling had to be transferred because according to the Puranas, the shivling is on the beach. But the temple currently is not on the beach because it had to be shifted. Okay. So uh, that, that, that boat still stands outside the Mailapur temple. So uh, the point I was making is the British man, when he comes to the south from Bengal, he is asking himself, how can this be part of the same culture when there are such clear, stark differences from language to speaking habits to whatnot. Okay, so when they come to Bharat, the diversity leads them to believe that it is an artificial synthetic creature that's been put together. There is otherwise no commonality or unity underlying this diversity. Which even in medieval India, the Muslims were also, the Muslim invaders Correct. were also saying that, that there is no homogeneity. There is no homogeneity here. This does not uh, sit within the definition of what constitutes a nation. Mm. So that's why they had this problem. Apart from that, when you go to the south, it's hot as hell, right? So Madras was a punishment posting. So usually... For the colonialists. For the colonialists. Which is where they would have let's to... Let's just specify, not for the Indian Foreign Service. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So oh. these guys would then establish places like Uti, Kodai Kanal, because they need their hill stations. Now when they come here, they realize that this is, uh, this is perhaps not the place that they want to be. So obviously there's a certain degree of neglect that Madras receives at the hands of the colonial establishment. Mm. Okay, so that's one. Two, there is also a homegrown or indigenous call, thanks to the missionary work, saying that we are different. Mm. So there is neglect from the colonial establishment coupled with a homegrown feeling of separatism. Both of them contribute to special treatment being the, the norm as far as the South is concerned, or particularly for the Tamil state. Okay, this has always been the case. As this goes along... Uh, you will see that uh, once you inch closer to the to to the independence movement, there are two parallel movements going on. One is the Congress movement led by Rajaji and others, and um, Annie Besant, and parallelly the Justice Party's constant attempts at somehow pre pre let's say uh, protecting the status quo and repeated entities to the uh, to the British uh, establishment to stay back. Mm -hmm. Now it is surprising that the descendants of this particular party with its history of British loyalism question every other organization about their contributions to the independence movement. People have never asked what is the contribution of the Dravidianist movement to independence, if at all. In fact, their contribution has been to the negative. They've always wanted India to be a British dominion with absolutely no role for autonomy whatsoever. At one point, the missionaries who were guiding and... and um, how do I put it, enlightening the, the ideologues of the, the Dravidianist movement, they wanted destruction of caste altogether to be included in the manifesto of There's these organizations. There's nothing wrong in that. No, hold on. Hmm. 
the reason why the missionaries want the destruction of caste is not because they want an egalitarian society it takes away that one final barrier that prevents conversion because caste was seen as a huge stumbling block to conversion from hinduism to christianity okay so those who see uh, caste as an evil uh, institution its nature and how you have seen it has changed with time and yeah because nowadays what people would think is that because of casteism conversions are happening correct so that happened later initially caste was a barrier and then the missionaries realize if i were to actually break this barrier i get an entire caste group on my side okay, okay. so there are two phases during this period so that non brahmin is the caste group here exactly okay so they realize that the f- in the first instance this is the institution that stands as the barrier in in the way of conversion hmm. particularly because you're not able to get the brahmins so then they decide to go to the next level which is just since i can't convert the brahmin let me drive a wedge between the brahmins and the non brahmins and then see if there is a way of harvesting more souls from the non brahminical fold harvesting souls from the non brahminical okay and you will see this significantly in southern parts of tamil nadu where there are entire groups which have converted hmm okay groups which otherwise do not have any uh, basis to claim that they were persecuted groups which have been either landed or mercantile and people who perhaps actually uh, resort even to downstream casteism further this is uh, i'm digressing but is this is something that was seen in southeast asia also isn't it it's not just in uh, like if you were to see in indonesia right. if you were to see in philippines if you were to see in burma hmm. erstwhile myanmar i mean right. burma right. Uh, in even in these places this is what was happening where it was because there are tamilians even in these areas right right right, right, they, right, right, right. they had gone for various reasons not singapore. to convert singapore right. you're seeing that and you see lee kuan yew also saying that right. uh, people came in but the chinese civilization and the indian, indian civilization, civilization did correct. not you've seen that famous speech of lee kuan yew in which correct. he says that, that he's addressing the students there he's addressing students and he says that it, it withstands that kind of change um anyway let me come back to that uh, bit about uh, you know uh, when you talked about separatism of the justice party and then the dk right uh, what is the connection between now the dk dmk with this whole tamil elam bit so this dmk is the political offshoot or political successor of the dk okay so it one is a cultural organization the other is a political organization or whatever parallels you wish to draw with any other organization there it stands now dmk uh, starts making its uh, efforts to gain power and the first time it manages to gain power i think is in 1967 in the elections of 1967 and i think the then congress chief minister was bhaktavat salam hmm. who loses to the dmk and i think congress congress yes. and yeah. it was his statement and i think i think it was a prophetic statement that cancer is infected uh, tamil nadu Okay he made that And stick. the Congress has never come to power since, Ever since. then it hasn't hmm. because Dravidianism has become the norm all the parties that you see which have some kind of say in Tamil Nadu politics are some kind of MK or Dravid Munnetra Kalagam MDMK ADMK this DMK this is always there because Dravidianism has to be paid obeisance to if you want to survive in Tamil Nadu politics and for a, for a, for the first time i think under Annamalai that's changed that barometer has changed significantly Anadurai also was the same then. Yes, hundred percent. He was, of course, a DMK ideologue. Mm. He couldn't have been any different. Mm. His difference of opinion with Periyar is single-handedly responsible for the DMK being formed because uh, EVR specifically wanted to limit himself to societal activity, mm. whereas these people were interested in being in politics and securing power because it was their belief that you cannot bring about social change without having power, and therefore it's important to g- gain access to power. So from the DK to the DMK the journey is rife with regular uh, marches with Hindu deities being uh, garlanded with slippers and regular speeches being uh, aired on a uh, in writing as well as in their in their uh, election speeches where Hindu gods would be denigrated the unfortunate reality is there is also a significant degree of overlap between Ambedkarite movement and the Dravidian movement it's not as if they have never collaborated with each other to a significant extent they have and if you were to draw parallels between the two the fact that they saw the dalits the bahujans and the muslims as forming one block and the savarna hindus as forming another block is a certain parallel it is a certain comparison 
So we may want to even ask this question, why is it that Indian history has given two different treatments, one to the Ambedkarat movement and one to the Dravidianist movement? That's an uncomfortable question for people to ask. Hmm. Why do you want to have two different yardsticks or standards to be applied to two sets of movements, both of which are based on anti-Brahminism, both of which ultimately led to calls for, or which have denigrated Hinduism significantly. There are quite a few speeches of the icons of both movements which have targeted uh, Sri Ram, Sri Krishna, so on and so forth. Their character has been called into question. They have been accused of being regressive, patriarchal and whatnot. All sorts of things yeah. have been said. In fact, uh, this, this uh, 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 Periyar, when he, uh, he talked about it, so it's not as if what Udainidhi has said is something new. It's not It's new. not historical. Because, uh, you know, he said uh, when he talks about the Congress and the Dravida movement and he says right. that the first would be the destruction. First thing that should be done is the destruction of the Congress party. Right. Uh, then the second is the destruction of the Hindu religion. Right. And the third is the destruction and the domination of uh, Brahmins. Right. And this would automatically happen if the first two tasks are completed. Are these positions any different from Dr. Ambedkar's position in annihilation of caste? Exactly what he said. Hmm. That the only way you get to annihilate caste is by an annihilating Hindu dharma because at the end of the day, Varnashrama dharma and Sanatana dharma or Hindu dharma are inseparable. And you cannot have, you cannot protect one without destroying the other. Or you can't destroy one without destroying the other. There is an extremely uh, dual treatment that Indian history and Indian political discourse has meted out to the same opinion coming from two different people. Perhaps the striking distinction is that one sought secession, the other sought special treatment within the constitution through reservations. When did that desire for secession stop in the Dravid movement and uh, in Tamil Nadu? Largely because of the ion treatment meted out by both Nehru as well as Indira Gandhi subsequently. The amendment to the constitution. Not just amendment to the constitution, even uh, the president's rule being imposed in Tamil Nadu for some of their activities, uh, especially once the DMK came to power. These are instances which force them to change their track or to change their tack without actually changing the end goal. So the secessionist aspect of their entire movement was pushed to the back burner. 69. 69. And... It would translate to support for extraterritorial Tamil interests, such as the LTTE. Because here is another body that is capable of speaking for establishment of a separate Tamil Elam. So why don't we revive this interest in the garb or under the garb of supporting a Tamil interest in Sri Lanka? Why is it that the DMK enjoyed such a bonhomie and camaraderie with the LTTE is a question that has to be asked. In that contest, or rather in that context, uh, Despite my strong disagreements with the former uh, or the deceased Ms. Jalalita, she was, I would say, openly, bluntly, candidly patriotic, nationalistic. She'd say, I am never going to support this under any circumstances. One of the reasons that she had to start wearing that bulletproof vest was because of the threats that she was re receiving from under the Under that cape, yes. Correct. So that she had to. These are the kind of ant antecedents that, that saddle the history of the DMK or the Dravidianist movement. It needs to be studied in greater detail. I want to read out this uh, letter that Nehru had written to K Kamraj, who was then the chief minister of Madras. And he was writing about uh, Periyar and he said, I do hope you will take it's adequate lunatic. notice. Right. And he writes in 1957, this is almost more than 10 years before the crackdown. Uh, on the DMK, in which he says, he tells uh, uh, that EVR should be put in a court, in a lunatic asylum right. and let his perverted mind be treated out there. I think it's also somehow convenient to hold the Congress alone responsible for this. Uh, since I am, I belong to no organization, I can speak my mind independently. Sure. Even nationalist political parties seem to be singing praises, uh, or rather singing pains in praise of uh, Periyar or E.V. Ramaswamy these days. That has happened. I've seen that happen. Under the name of political compulsion, all that is anti-Hindu and hence anti-Bharat is being normalized. And that should have never happened. So, while the Congress must be held significantly for joining hands with this kind of an entity, I mean, subsequently, it remains a fact that non-Congress options have done that as well. National political parties other than the Congress have done that as well. There are statements to this effect. Because they believe that it's not possible for them to open their account in the state of Tamil Nadu without actually paying obeisance to this figure. Who all are you going to pay obeisance to? 
everyone who has contributed to the fall of the civilization or everyone who has prayed for the fall of the civilization. So what are you going to sacrifice at the altar of political dharma? See, it's like this. Assume for a moment that it becomes impossible to win an election in the Kashmir Valley in the future uh, without paying obeisance to Gilani. Will you do it? Will you do it? You wouldn't because he wielded the gun and he spoke openly. What did this person do or what did his uh, ideological successors do except for wielding the gun? They have wielded the knife for God's sakes. And they have exterminated communities. Vikram Sampath spoke beautifully of the massacre of Maharashtrian Brahmins post Gandhi's assassination in Maharashtra. Mm. And the active participation of several communities, all of them, several groups, all of them Hindu groups in this massacre. Mm. Nobody has spoken of the treatment meted out over decades to the Tamil Brahmin community or even the Telugu Brahmin community. The divide that you see, or let's say the linguistic chauvinism that is prevalent even within the South is significantly a product of Dravidianist chauvinism and separatism, where it chooses to say Telugu is more Sanskritized, so let it be treated as a separate uh, a group altogether. But Tamil must gain supremacy because in the in the in the hierarchy of languages, if Sanskrit rules the roost in the north, Tamil shall rule the roost in the south. This is the kind of special treatment that they have arrogated to this. I don't say that Tamil pride is bad. I don't say that there should be no pride for this language. It's one of the oldest languages, not the oldest language. It is one of the oldest languages and it has its own fantastic literature. You don't need to call it the oldest language just to pander to Dravidianist sentiments. And whoever is doing this, whichever position they occupy, they are not helping the cause of Bharatiya integrity and, and, and let's say unity by constantly pandering to the ego of the Dravidianist by calling it the oldest language. There is a lot more to celebrate about Tamil. There is a lot to be praised about. But don't pander to this particular sentiment. And you're doing this, you're being penny-wise and pound-foolish. And this pro-Tamil movement uh, also gets a lot of energy with this anti-Hindi movement that happens. Because it's seen as the direct successor of Sanskrit. The, the, the script doesn't really help because it's the Devanagari script. How each of this has played a huge, huge role. I think in one of that speeches that you mentioned, I clearly pointed out how all of Indian languages were ultimately traced to the sons of Noah. <laughs> yeah, which is bizarre. So but tell us about this. Three of the sons of Noah apparently are responsible for Sanskrit and the final son, the unfortunate son who's abandoned, is the son who's responsible for all the Dravidian languages. Dravida ultimately is a word that comes from Sanskrit, which effectively translates to peninsula, a landed body surrounded by water on three sides. That is Dravida. Why is this important? We have the concept of the Dravidian Brahmins and Gaudiya Brahmins, which is those Brahminical Gotras who are from the south and those Brahminical groups who are from the, from the north. So it has always been a geographical connotation, not a racial, not a racist, not an ethnic or a linguistic connotation. But the use of Dravida in an ethnocentric sense, was done by a German missionary for the very first time and then subsequently Robert Caldwell takes it forward. It is so unfortunate that we continue to peddle this nonsense to our own detriment. Just compare. So there's a brilliant network. Whenever you're on YouTube, please watch it. It's called the African News Network. Hmm. How beautifully contemporary African leaders are examining the colonial in influence on their uh, contemporary realities in and why they speak in English. Why is it that Africa needs more passports within its own continent for people to move from one part to another? Just watch it. And you'll ask yourself what an enlightened, enlightening conversation Africans are indulging in with respect to the colonial past. And the very same discussion cannot be had properly in this country because you'll be accused of being a Hindutva fascist, this and that. I said this even before. The European colonizer and his Christian uh, uh, urge to reform people and to harvest souls has had an influence across continents. Bharat being no exception. When the rest of the world and all these affected con uh, let's say continents are having a free and open discussion, why is Bharat stifling this discussion in the name of secularism? Hmm. Why is it stifling this in the name of historical revisionism? This is not revisionism. These are documented facts coming from even scholars from abroad. I can give you at least three or four names. Eugene Urshik, a journalist born in 1969 in Kodai Kanal, captured clearly the missionary hand in cultivating the political ideology of Dravidianism. 
Professor Sweetman says this as much. Nicholas Dux, Dux speaks of caste. I point this out in so many lectures. One of the finest books written on the subject, uh, which people must read, is authored by Sri Raji Malhotra and Arvind Neelakantan, Breaking India, where they put all of this together in a beautiful fashion. I have my disagreements with a lot of people, but if a work is worthy of attention and it, it needs to be read, I will certainly push it regardless of who writes it. Hmm. And this is something that must be read. People should read this. Sai, it's uh, we we were talking about 1969 and uh, you know the the parties with whether the DMK, the AIDMK. Now it's now close to what 50 years right. since the Dravid parties have been there. Essentially, they talk about anti-casteism. Right. More than you know, we we can talk about various things. Right. Today, Uday Nidhi has talked about Sanatan. Right. But it's anti-casteism right. basically, right? But if they have been in power for so many years in one form or the other... They haven't been able to do anything. Why have they not you been You know able what? To There's eliminate? literature to show that ever since the ride of, uh, rise of Dravidianist ideology, the number of cases where the uh, establishments or the settlements of the SESTs have been put to or set to fire and the kind of atrocities that they've been subjected to by people who claim to fight in their name. So here's what happens. The strategy has always been this, whether you call it the communist movement or social justice movement anywhere. A lot of landed groups which have a certain sense of antipathy towards the non-landed priestly community choose to use the shoulder of the actually affected parties to fire their bullets from. Hmm. Right? In the name of social justice. Now, what social justice? Who has benefited at the end of this? Let us actually undertake a clear study of what kind of benefits have been apportioned by the Indian state for the welfare of the SCST communities in Tamil Nadu and how many of them have benefited to what extent? Has the rise of Dravidianism translated to re reduction in violence against these groups? Who is responsible for the commitment of this violence? People who are less than 2.5% of the population in Tamil Nadu today who have never wielded the weapon, which is the Tamil Brahmins, or others. Let's have this conversation. It's mighty convenient to constantly paint the Brahmin as this venomous snake. In fact, he was the one to come out. I think there was this uh, Dravidianist poet, Bharti Dasan, who basically came out with this saying that if you see a snake and you see a Brahmin, kill the Brahmin first. This reeks and smacks of Nazi propaganda. And Nazis used uh, the television or let's say the movies, and so was the case with uh, the Dravidianists as well. There's another thing that you must ask yourself. Okay, you want to talk about egalitarianism, equality. Fine. Why do you want to remove caste names only from roads? Remove it altogether from each of your minister's names. And let's say, let's do away with reservations altogether. Why don't you have this conversation? Equality should mean no reservation in your dense head. Because that's your approach to equality otherwise. Sai, it's over a hundred years since the Dravid movement. Now, they wanted to eradicate casteism. Uh, Sanatan was one of the words, but then they wanted to eradicate casteism. DMK is in power right now. Why is it that casteism is not over and it's still practiced? And there is now a new form of casteism which is coming up. Uh, so here I'm reading out from an article in the Indian Express. It says, English media, it says, In this belt in southern Tamil Nadu, known for violent caste conflicts between OBCs and Dalits, these wristbands are markers that tell children who's a friend who isn't. Though there are no written rules, students usually know their colours by the time they reach high school. It's red and yellow for Tevars, blue and yellow for Nadars, saffron for Yadavs, all socially and politically powerful Hindu communities that come under the most backward classes category, MBCs. While students of the Dalit community of Pallars wear wristbands in green and red and Arundhatiyars also uh, wear green and uh, red, Dalits wear green, black and white. So my question Sai, is that after 100 years uh, since the Dravidian movement, why is caste-based slavery of sorts still prevalent? Heart of the social justice movement hmm. should have translated to being a paradise of social justice. Yeah, That hasn't happened, right? Okay, I'll, I'll explain how fundamentally anti-scientific, historically stupid the, the, the entire uh, myth of Dravidianism is. So, around what we call Avani Atam, which is Upakarma Day, in Shravanamas, what we do, so Brahmins change their Janyu. Okay. 
it's not a caste mark first of all across the board several castes were the janu it's not just the brahmin it's never been the sole preserve of the brahmin every community which has been deemed as a dwija has worn it twice born yes hmm. so i uh, when i was doing my mechanical engineering the one who was teaching foundry to me so foundry is where you actually make molds and dies and what not it, it requires a lot of physical labor that man basically said you iers can't do this we also wear punal look at us we also do it i said sir where is this coming from no he said see i am a vishwakarma i wear it but even i can do this mm. so people in each of those fields you'll see pictures in the british period of potters and what not wearing the punal why is this important because around the upakarma day uh, which is when you change you, the you change the janeu every year the dmk makes it a point to come out with a caricature of a pig wearing the janeu how does this not attract section 295a how does this not attract hatred for a particular group in the name of social justice how long are you going to target and 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 come after this one particular community across the board this has happened in this country i am open to all the hate mail that's going to come towards me for having said this i am open to it i'll swallow the poison i have no problems someone has to do the wishpan i'll be the person to do it i have no problems but there is hypocrisy in indian political social and caste discourse across the board on this particular subject this needs to be spoken of hmm. it's finally important people are happy when i speak of decoloniality as long as it supports them and helps them chalo i'll use decoloniality in a different sense now i'll talk about this as well what about bihar and uttar pradesh they've had caste based parties right did it is it different from tamil nadu the impression that dravidianist ideologues want to give to the rest of the world Hmm. is that the south and especially tamil nadu is a paradise of development is a paradise of caste uh, of of uh, lack of casteism so on and so forth i am sorry that is not the case from the film industry to every possible industry there is not a single sphere of activity which is untouched by caste and politics of tamil nadu is certainly caste entrenched they don't get to hold this moral high ground with anybody else at all when they constantly say you should see these arrogant absolutely uh, abysmal posts on twitter where they see you north indians this and that uh, you are you come from the cow belt you come to tamil nadu we are this and that what are you talking about yeah. really what are you talking about we have lived in this place in several parts of of and here's the thing traditionally tamilians have been extremely welcoming of people with talent the tamil film industry for the better part of it was run even by telugus because madras used to be the hub for everyone at that point the icons that you have supported from mgr to everybody else they have been non tamilians so tamilians as a people are welcoming mm. but the political discourse of tamil nadu is narrow minded has positioned itself and pitted itself against the rest of bharat mm. to the extent that when a soldier of this country who comes back home or who comes from a different part of this country goes to tamil nadu is lynched this cannot happen this is dangerous okay let's assume for a moment this had happened in punjab what would all of us be saying oh khalistan is again on the rise if this had happened to a soldier of this country at the hands of khalistanis in punjab you would have said that khalistanism is back no uh, say it's happening in uh, karnataka also auto drivers who write out there unless you speak in kannada i am not going to it's happening in many no, places no i wouldn't no? agree with that and there's a reason for this Th- think about it this way you go to maharashtra or you go to karnataka what are they basically worried about the loss of the culture of that land that is a legitimate human sentiment across the board it happened in the 60s and things lungis they were called the i am not Indians. going to justify all yeah. the measures that were used to further this particular sentiment or when you say uh, lungi uthao pungi bajao and all that whatever they said yeah. i don't agree with it yeah. i am not saying i agree with the means but what are you looking at if the very same sentiment were to be aired by someone from the northeast or assam you'd immediately say oh there is some sense to it why don't kannadigas get to say this why don't telugus get to say this why don't tamilians get to say this i am not going to stand even for one bit to say that one indian cannot visit another part of bharat hmm. one bharatiya must have the right to visit every part and of by bharat. property 100% by property marry settle there cannot be any kind of restrictions there hmm. however what do they expect you've come here you lived for generations together at least speak our language mm. you want an example the um what is this recently at at one of my uh, public engagements there members of the jain community came and spoke 
you talk or, uh, or rather you look at them you will not feel that they are from any other part of the country except tamil nadu karnataka karnataka as well as in uh, tamil nadu yeah the marwadis of uh, tamil nadu you speak with them they will speak tamil so they have embraced this because the nature of the bharatiya basically is that he would want to embrace the local culture if he chooses to settle there mm-hmm. it's not as if we are itinerants going from one place to another without mingling with the local community at all so the expectation that if you are here at least pick up the language when i was studying engineering a lot of my friends were maithais from manipur i can name them i don't want to name them because of the circumstances today but very dear friends i don't want them to be affected because of their affiliation with me they picked up tamil within 4 years of education so the insistence that first learn our language is not a wrong insistence mm. that is to ensure that you're not submerged in the deluge of globalization and this cosmopolitanism because cosmopolitanism usually pits itself against the urge to preserve your culture and language that is human personally i feel more languages you know in india better it is for you 100% all and of us should be polyglots agreed demystify this for me what is sanatana dharma what is dharma because uh, television channels today are all talking about uh, that dharma is a separate thing sanatana dharma is a separate thing hinduism is a separate thing hindutva is a separate thing <laughs> we've already in our earlier podcast talked the about between hinduism uh, and hindutva hinduism and hindutva and for those who want to see the earlier podcast you can and in one of them and i'm going to quote this uh, sai has said if hinduism were living in peace time then hindutva will sleep but if that's not the case hinduism has to stand up hindutva has to stand up and it is the kshatra aspect of hinduism right. this is in the earlier podcast with uh, j sai deep but you can watch that so now tell me what is the difference between these right the sanatana dharma dharma uh, hinduism hindutva are they linked at all see it's like this you have to take a look at the debates surrounding the definition of hindu in the constant assembly as to how they chose to group it all together hmm. right so hinduism under the constitution is an agglomeration of multiple identities within so jains buddhists sikhs are all seen as constitutionally hindus it's a little odd no why don't the jains i mean the jains don't consider themselves want, a mi- see, minority see here's the thing you can oh. you can consider yourself a minority from the perspective of section 20 or other article 29 hmm. as a cultural minority hmm. and still be part of hinduism okay. there is no contradiction between the two there's no conflict between the two positions the important point is uh, if you look at uh, the definition of hinduism one is what is the core of it the vedic religion is seen as the core of it and the vedic religion is seen as the core of it sanatana dharma is and is is the same as vedic religion for all practical purposes now then you have Wait, other isn't sanatana dharma from the upanishads and can that be outside the vedic tradition when you speak of the upanishads not. it has okay. to be Okay. It, Upanishad is Vedanta. Because the uh, Arya Samaji say that that is what separates them from. So Sanat. that's what I'm coming to. Okay. So this is the core. From there, you're looking at the Buddhist offshoot. From there, you're looking at the Shramana or the Jain offshoot. The difference, primarily, being whether they treat Veda as the primary authority with respect to what is Dharma and on the path to the Supreme or the Brahman. Okay. The difference in these positions is what is the primary Pramana. or the primary proof or evidence okay so the centrality or that particular faith system or that particular core which gives centrality to the vedic uh, position is the vedic religion and therefore that is seen as the brahmanical religion so on and so forth other offshoots are also part of the larger dharmic fold but which do not give centrality to the vedas hmm. that is our distinction of the astika and the nastika hmm. not the atheist and the theist those who give centrality to vedas are seen as the astic and those who don't are seen as the nastika then not of the book so not of the book not of, the not book. of this book correct when you saying correct okay. then when you look at arya samajis that is a relatively later movement of swami dayananda saraswati it's a, huh, it's a brahmo very brahmo samaj correct. samaj correct so samaj each of these th- see themselves as part of the dharmic fold of the hindu fold but they may have differences of opinion with the in fact the bhakti movement like arya samaji the... see themselves as followers of the veda yeah correct but their position is we stick to the veda to such an extent that all other vedic knowledge that has come out let's say agama shastra jyotish what not we reject that mm. so they are literalists when it comes to the interpretation of the veda and the idols and the idols right mm. they they don't see themselves as murti pujaks mm. 
this is broadly the distinction i am here making an academic distinction i have no interest in offending these sentiments sure. because for me they are part of the hindu fold Correct. i may have disagreements with several of these sects as a practice of the vedic faith but nevertheless i am not going to sit and offend these sentiments today because if you're a, if you're a practitioner of the hindu belief system the idea is to make sure that you don't create fissures within the fold as much as possible hmm. you have a conversation but you try not to create fissures hmm. anyways this is it is an adhyatmic discussion anyway right? it is an you adhyatmic can... discussion yeah. right and if you see some of the uh, exchanges these adhyatmic exchanges the language actually gets fairly violent <laughs> okay in any case i'll just come back to this so when someone says sanatana dharma is not the same as hinduism that may be definitionally fine but the fact is sanatana dharma is the core of hinduism and therefore under the law even an insult to a part of the faith is an insult of the faith itself so assume for a moment i were to take pot shots at a particular group of a particular faith system will they not have the right to invoke the law saying that these sentiments have been offended under a religious basket hmm. pentecostals can say something the seventh ray methodists can say something each of them has the right to the same protection as a christian would because they are all seen as being part of the christian fold so you don't get to say that they are so divergent to say that one is not entirely the same as the other is to strike a distinction between the superset and the subset hmm. right there is an umbrella there is a smaller umbrella but nevertheless the smaller umbrella is within the bigger umbrella and most importantly in this case sanatana dharma is the core of the hindu faith system everybody else establishes their identity by distinguishing themselves from the core faith system because this is the yardstick this is the norm this is the benchmark so constitutionally what is hinduism and who is a hindu because there are competing uh, theories there is this. no definition of a hindu hmm. as to what makes a hindu a hindu who is a hindu is identified if you're a sikh this is based on self identification in that particular sense however what are the principles of hindu dharma have been culled out and distilled in several uh, judgments of the supreme court citing works of ramakrishna mission and so on and so forth there's a longish discussion that's been undertaken there so what is a hindu one who believes in the concept of karma one who believes in the concept of therefore reincarnation one who believes in the context of uh, sorry in the, in the in the concept of brahman the supreme consciousness there are some common precepts that the supreme court has actually identified as what constitutes a hindu by definition but there might be hindus who don't there believe might in be. it but still you're a hindu you're still a hindu so uh-huh. the larger definition is that if it is a faith system hmm. that is native to this land it is seen as hinduism otherwise tribals how would you call them hindu hmm the definition if these were the yardsticks and this is how you go about it how do you then call tribals hindus the reason is they are native to this particular geography their faith system is native to this particular geography which is why here is the enmeshing between the geographical aspect of the word hindu and the religious aspect of the word hindu a faith system which has emanated from this land is largely within the broad fold of hinduism that would include animism that would include several practices even in the northeast you have to ask this question or maita is hindus or not that will take us You'll, in a slightly different direction and all this will need to be absorbed when we talk about the ucc at some point of time 100% so again in your city that is bangalore sorry your city would be delhi bangalore <laughs> okay <laughs> would be where would i start i don't even know okay so i delivered a lecture recently which was of course the subject of a controversy where uh, before the lecture was even delivered there is uh, there is a non descript group of leftist lawyers who basically said how can you call him for a debate on this he will not present a balanced picture i presented both sides mm. and contrary to popular perception i raised problems also with the concept of a ucc in light of severe diversity even within the hindu fold i have not taken a position pro or against i've just said these are the multiple considerations that you have to take into account before you even arrive at a consensus if at all it's even possible you really doubt that it's even possible why because of this the diversities see for a moment even if i were to forget as to what rights others would lose i'm interested only in what rights we lose my simple question will be this boleto? hindus okay today we have the hindu succession act which remains the last remaining vestige of our cultural relationship with our past in terms of succession laws matrimony laws so on and so forth will the ucc do away with the hindu succession act and therefore the mitakshara and the dayabhaga systems which are entrenched as part of that succession act legitimate question to ask 
Mm-hmm. Because the codification that you undertook in the 1950s did away with a lot of other systems. You decided that these are the only two systems. Mm. And that's effectively received knowledge from the colonial master. Mm. Any case, you resorted to this. You have now said this is the case. Do we stand to lose even these two remaining systems if this Hindu civil code is so to speak were to be replaced with a uniform civil code? Now is a uniform civil code a uniformly religious civil code or is it a secular civil code? If it is a secular civil code, what will it draw its inspirations from? Questions to ask. I am not standing in the way of it. I am saying these are legitimate questions to ask. On the question of marriage, what is the position going to be drawn from? On the question of succession of property, what is the position going to be drawn from? Each of these questions, this is what you, you wish to address, right? Answer these questions. Hmm. There needs to be a debate. There needs it. to be a debate. Okay. I am not going to stand in the way of a discussion on the topic contrary to what the other side has said. Hmm. Okay? They don't want this discussion ever because every time you raise it, it is apparently anti-minority. That I am not in favor of. The conversation needs to start. But there also needs to be clarity in terms of the boundary conditions within which we operate. Uh, Sai, first to come back uh, to what we were discussing about Sanatana yeah. uh, Dharma. Uh, do you think that now Sanatana Dharma, the uh, eradication of Sanatana Dharma, uh, Hindutva, the whole thing is going to now dominate the Con- uh, the conversation from 2023 uh, second half to 2024 uh, elections is it going to become so putrid now that we will that religion is going to be dragged in and that's going to set the benchmark about how the discourse is going to be uh, till 2024 everything that makes bharat bharat will be called into question and india this coalition in my assessment is going to adopt a scorched earth policy to burn everything that we hold dear in its bid to gain power. And you are a supposedly apolitical person or you don't uh, proscribe Every to Every Indian is a political person. Okay. <laughs> I am not associated with a political organization. All right. Period. I will not speak for any political organization. If I speak for a political organization, it will be on a particular issue. Mine will be an issue-based approach. Okay. If there's a happy coincidence between a position that I hold dear, which I believe is good for Bharatiya civilization, whoever endorses that position, I will vote for them. Period. Right. It's unfortunate that we don't have too many takers. Hmm. So it's for the Congress to ask, what has it done wrong? So you think that uh, this is a healthy conversation or unhealthy to bring this out in the open now? It's an inevitable conversation. Inevitable. 100%. I am not going to sit and judge on whether it's good or bad. I think it's inevitable because they have revealed their cards finally. The end game of Dravidianism was always destruction of Hinduism. When they strike, so what did they start with? No, we want to destroy only Brahmanism, not Hinduism. Now they are saying we will destroy only Sanatana Dharma, not Hinduism. How far is it from here to destruction of Hinduism? (laughs) <laughs> That's what you started off initially. You know, uh, uh, in uh, Sai, there are many people on social media and what you said also, which is that garlanding of idols with chappals, mm. right? Now, this is something which in the north, it was talked about when it was happening in UP, Bihar and all that. When it was being talked about, the media reported it. But the uh, the statements which were made in Tamil Nadu, not much reporting was done in the national media as such. Language barrier. Language barrier. So now they're Tyranny saying, of distance. From Delhi (laughs) or from the Noida channels as they say now. (laughs) So now that the speeches are being translated and now that mainstream media, national media is covering it, it's coming out in the open. They're saying that it was something which was not hidden, uh, which there are two views. One is that what Udainidhi has said today was spoken in whispers by Stalin and by Karunanidhi, his father and grandfather. That's one view. The second view was no, it was not said in in whispers. It was said in the open, it was just not translated correct, by correct, correct. English media. So the ideologues always were blunt and clear about it. So for instance, Mr. Veeramani, who is the current head of the DK, mm. uh, has always been consistently and virulently anti-Hindu, anti-Sanatana Dharma in every form possible. Mm. So they wouldn't resort to any kind of airbrushing or pixelation. Mm. But politicians would be careful about it because they wouldn't want to hurt sentiments beyond a point in the interest of securing power. So when the time is right, they would start speaking about it. Now, this gentleman obviously made us, uh, I mean, he gave a speech with anything uh, from the presence of Don Bosco. And uh, he was emboldened to actually issue quite a few things in that particular speech, which preceded this uh, eradication conference or Sanatana Dharma eradication conference. People should watch it, but pe- most people don't understand Tamil. So at least learn Tamil just to understand <laughs> what Hindu anti-Hindu nonsense is being spewed there. Let me also just clarify, this is crucial. 
Tamilians are not anti-Hindus by default. So don't make that mistake. Don't equate Tamil pride with anti-Hinduism. Because there is also a serious rise of Hindu consciousness in Tamil Nadu. Let's not forget the number of temples in that place, 38,000 and more. There are still people who throng those temples. And it's not as if it's only by tourists. Tamil Hindus do it. The Tamil Hindu sentiment is so strong in Singapore, in Malaysia and the expats. On a regular basis, I get letters and emails from three sets of Tamils. Sri Lankan Tamils, Sri Lankan Tamils from uh, uh, London, all Hindus, practicing Hindus who are proud of their faith systems, uh, and uh, Tamils from Malaysia and Singapore. All of them saying, what is wrong with the political discourse in Tamil Nadu? Because you see, Tamil Hindus in Malaysia are bearing the brunt for being a minority and a Hindu minority where conversions and forced conversions are on the rise. Even dead bodies are converted. Death certificates are issued only if they have converted to the, the majority religion of Malaysia. So they know what they are going through. And therefore they are acutely aware of the serious disastrous consequences of going down the path of Dravidianism. So those who wish to indulge in this conversation, please do not start with Tamil hatred or Tamilian hatred. This is a very important caveat. Strike a distinction between the Tamil identity and Dravidianist ideology. The, the villain here and the cancer here is the Dravidianist ideology. Please learn to focus your attention on these aspects. Otherwise, you will fuel another round of North-South divide, which is seriously problematic for where Bharat stands today. Don't indulge in this. Hmm. That's what are, I would say. Are you fearful of that North-South divide? I would say that if Dravidianism goes unchecked and it does not get or the pushback that it's supposed to from the state itself, from within the state itself, then they will fuel it further. Mm. And uh, I genuinely hope that all of the political forces in the state of Tamil Nadu who want to see Tamil Nadu prosper as part of Bharat and tie and, and ensure that its destinies are tied to that of Bharat, they should not let this succeed under any circumstances. I would say the Congress, at, at least in Tamil Nadu, should speak up. Speak up how? They are speaking in favour. It's unfortunate. I mean, considering the tradition that they have inherited through Rajaji and others and the position that they've taken now. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I take back what I said. I have no expectations from the Congress. But what about the, uh, you know, there was a statement I just heard from D. Raja and he said that uh, it's anti-Marx also. Is anti Anti-Marx comments are also made by uh, the BJP when they go to Tamil Nadu, just like they make anti-Dravid. Uh, remarks. So, anti-Sanatan, anti-Marx, anti... So, the, there is a getting together of... Uh, so, why don't we suspend the application of uh, Section 295A and 153A altogether to the state of Tamil Nadu? Let it be a free-for-all? Do it. Hmm. Let the state government say, we don't want the application of these penal provisions to this land. Because we are the land of free speech and equality and social justice and egalitarianism. Go ahead, do it. Will you do it? Is no, healthy you conversation possible? Healthy debate possible? It's possible nowhere anymore. No? A debate is not possible. A conversation is not possible. It's a slugfest out and out. And it's unfortunate that for you to be heard, you need to be the loudest. I, that is the unfortunate reality. And that's not something that's peculiar to Bharat anymore. Political atmosphere across the world is vitiated between the left and the right. Mm. But the hope is that at least sane voices emerge from this utterly chaotic din. And the people are given some kind of material, if not a sense of direction, because for you to give a sense of direction could be seen as condescending and patronizing because everybody's an adult, at least the voting population. Give them the material, let them form an opinion. Let's translate the entire Dravidianist literature and make it available across the country. Let this, uh, this poisonous tree defend itself against the rising tide of Bharatiya consciousness from Kashmir to Kanyakumari. Let it do it. Is there a rising consciousness? Do you feel that that consciousness is strong enough to have this debate at this stage? Here's my first-hand experience based on my interactions with the po uh, student population and other age groups across the country. They are sick and tired of this anti-Hindu nonsense. The kind of reception that I got for this uh, UCC lecture, the size of the hall was around 450. I, sorry, I'm not I'm not uh, uh, tooting my own horn here. I'm just telling you... No, I saw the pictures where people from the windows, windows were peering in. This is not about a person. This is more about their utter frustration that people use 
the 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 native spirit of this land as the softest possible punching bag as human doormats as cultural doormats this is a preparation for grounds of a future bloodbath hmm. thanks to the kind of statement that he's issued when you say that i didn't call for extermination of people i only called for extermination of the ideology so those who follow the ideology what are they supposed to do give up or die these are the only so two options what they saying is that even when somebody says garibi hatao it doesn't mean garib hatao right it means getting rid of poverty so when you say so when, is hinduism here poverty intellectual property or religious poverty no you're now going very literal right <laughs> 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 no when so you... let's ask ourselves this question if i am an adherent and a practitioner of sanatana dharma i am being told we will eradicate this so what are you going to eradicate all those institutions and infrastructure which represent this faith system so temples mm. do they represent sanatan dharma or not of course they do what will you do then so temples festivals so children will be bullied in schools that used to happen during the peak of the dravidian movement you would find it very difficult to walk on the streets regardless of the gender this is the second massive wave of anti brahmanism now yes it started with attacks on educational institutions which were seen as anti uh, as being brahmanical so the politicians of the dravidianist ide- ideology would be would insist on their children being educated in brahmanical institutions and schools in tamil nadu their children would study in those schools but for political reasons that school would be subjected to attacks but they don't even like we were talking about jay shankar or nirmal life they want to contest election so politically they have no voice so why be go against them now because it provides a fantastic political rallying point mm. hatred of a particular community which is completely disenfranchised in that particular state brings all the bile out and it gives you so if you're not able to give something positive to rally people together and your governance is in shambles Tamil Nadu is capable of a lot more and the utter corruption that it has witnessed over the last few years this is not a political statement this is a statement as a citizen i don't need to be a stooge of any political party to comment on these aspects chennai used to be the intellectual capital of the country along with calcutta look at the uh, the respective positions today industrial development frankly speaking they are still living on the currency of their past glory hmm. on the aspect of education you have ensured that the brilliant students of tamil nadu cannot compete with others by pampering a certain sense of exclusionism when it comes to medical entrance examinations all india entrance examinations neat yes you are saying that our students cannot compete with the best because our state syllabi is different and the central syllabi is different this is an aryan conspiracy is this the kind of nonsense that you actually peddle you hope to compete with china when you are actually making sure that students cannot even compete with people outside of tamil nadu so many people from tamil nadu come out and work in maharashtra in nagpur in so many other places and regardless of caste differences they end up learning that language and then they realize what they have suffered thanks to these politically imposed handicaps which are language based i am not saying everybody should learn hindi but at least have the common sense to learn the language if you want larger opportunities in this whole country in this big country if you want to go to some other part of the state or let's say the country you need to know the language Hmm. you're telling me that it's going to be possible for you to survive with tamil na- with uh, no- with the knowledge of tamil alone in other parts of the country that's not going to be possible i'll tell you the stupidity of even the pop culture there tamil hero goes to pakistan speaks in tamil and the pakistani muslim speaks in tamil <laughs> but the movies are fabulous and i know that thanks to now the ott there are so many uh, north indians who are watching south indian films including tamil films because you can you know dub it or you can watch it in other languages so i just hope maybe the next podcast we do will do in tamil and in hindi you should <laughs> you should we, we will be able it's to time for this content to go beyond hindi and english beyond hindi and english yes. right so we will do in you can't have lang- a delhi club we will do in multiple languages we probably have uh, you should be part of actually that other group that i have where we Sunday have breakfast club the, where we have no no where uh-huh. we have anand uh, ranganathan and we have uh, abhijit ayer mitra and we have sushant sarin <laughs> so we have a punjabi i don't know if i'll get have, access to that group 
<laughs> we have Tamil. We have discussions. Anand is a dear friend, of course. Yeah, so we have discussions in all these languages. We discussed mm. you too in that in one of them Ayyayo. where we talked. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we were talking about that, but anyway, but it's been fabulous talking to you. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, uh, I look forward to having you back on the show soon. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you for watching this edition of ANI podcast with Smita Prakash. Do write in to us with your suggestions. Do like or subscribe on whichever channel you have seen this or heard this. Namaste, Jai Hind. Click here to watch the previous episodes.